Hello, and welcome to the Hidden Gems of Blackboard, things you never knew Blackboard could do. Some of these have been hiding in plain sight, and some of them may be new features you just haven't seen before. So my name is Stephanie Richter. I'm the Assistant Director of the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University. I want to uh, acknowledge and appreciate as well that this workshop is built in large part on um, a list of a similar session offered by uh, Blackboard staff Vivek. If you ever watch this recording, Vivek, thank you for sharing your list of your top 10 hidden features of Blackboard so that I could work on that to share with our faculty and uh, students and guests here at NIU. So the first one, we're diving right in, no preamble here, is accessing Blackboard from a mobile device. I don't feel like this is particularly hidden, but I wanted to point out that there are multiple ways that you can do that. So when you're accessing Blackboard now from a mobile device, we have at NIU installed the latest uh, look and feel, the latest theme pack for Blackboard, which makes it mobile responsive. That means that now if you access Blackboard from a tablet or from your phone, it's not going to work as well as from the browser directly, but it will be more consistent and more usable to navigate through content and uh, a few of the interactive features. I wouldn't try still using your uh, mobile browser, for example, to access the Grade Center. Workflows for using the, the Grade Center from a smartphone are, are still in the works at Blackboard, but they are working on it. Um, in the meantime, though, it's a great way to for you to check um, a file, look to see what's already uh, available to your students, or um, send an announcement. However, that's not the only way to access Blackboard from a mobile device. You can also access Blackboard from the Blackboard Instructor app. So there are now two uh, user-based apps, persona-based is what Blackboard calls it. So you can access Blackboard from the Blackboard Instructor app to access courses that you are teaching. You can use that to preview the content or any of the assessments you've built in your course. You can actually participate as in post to an existing discussion board. You cannot create a discussion board, but you can post to an existing one. You can create announcements in order to update your students while you are on the go, and you can join Blackboard Collaborate sessions like this one from the Blackboard Instructor app. In fact, if you click a link in your email or elsewhere to join a Collaborate session, it will redirect and open the Blackboard Instructor app for you. Coming soon, you will be able to grade. Uh, you can currently grade on an iPad using a separate Blackboard Grader app, but coming soon, you'll be able to grade from directly within the Blackboard Instructor app as well. Um, I would expect that sometime in the next year. I don't have a firm timeline on that. So right now, you could grade on iPad only with BB Grader. But again, more grading functionality coming to the Blackboard Instructor app. There is also a student app called simply Blackboard that students can use to access the courses that they are taking. Whereas you, when you are teaching, would use the Blackboard Instructor app. I'm going to post the link to our documentation on the Blackboard mobile into the, the text chat there. So you can click that link and go off to learn more, if you'd like, about the Blackboard mobile apps and the Blackboard mobile experience. Moving right along, let's talk about uh, one of the most popular features. As soon as any of our staff talk about this one with faculty, they're immediately excited about it. But it's something you don't ever know exists until uh, you find it, because it is pretty hidden. There's a feature in Blackboard that lets you quickly and easily manage all of the availability and due dates that are set in your course. It's called date management. So you would access date management from the control panel in your course under course tools. From there, you can uh, reset your course deadline or your course dates so that they are automatically redistributed uh, based on the start date of your course. So for example, if you copied a course from the fall 2016 semester 
to reuse for the fall 2017 semester, you could tell Blackboard what the start date was for fall 2016 and the start date for fall 2017, and Blackboard would adjust all of the dates accordingly so that if something was due on the first Monday, it's again due on the first Monday. You can also tell it to offset by a certain window. So if you have all of your dates set up for a Monday, Wednesday course, and you copy that for a Tuesday, Thursday course, you could tell Blackboard to adjust all of your dates by one day so that everything pushes back to be due or opening on Tuesday instead of on Monday. But more than that, what I particularly like, while the automatic feature saves a ton of time, I also like using the manual adjustment because what date management will do is show you all of the availability dates or all of the due dates that are anywhere in your course. And from here then, I could select one using the uh, pencil icon here to the right in order to modify that particular date. So by seeing them all on one page and by sorting them by, by name or by uh, date, I could actually adjust them fairly straight, fairly easily by seeing them all together um, rather than in Blackboard hunting and pecking through to find where the discussion was with the due date and where the folder is with an availability date, I can see them all in one place. Now, what this doesn't actually change is any place where you have typed a date. So if you um, put a date into a description, for example, say that this folder name was week one, August 21st through August 28th, it's not going to find the text that you typed, but it will find the official date that you specified. Uh, Kenjana, yes, I don't have a slide with where, how to get to it. Um, I'll tell you again though, and I will give you the link to all of our documentation on it. So date management is under course tools, well it's under control panel, course tools, date management. I put that in the text chat as well. So it's, it's a great, powerful tool just to see that all of your ducks are in a row, so to speak, that everything has been changed and you didn't miss one um, start date or due date somewhere buried underneath. Yes, thumbs up indeed. Uh, this is a very, very useful tool to know about. The third hidden gem I wanted to share with you is relates to the calendar. So a small matter potentially of productivity, but it may have a, a big impact on how you uh, work with your calendar and managing your time. And the same can be true for students as they're starting to discover uh, planning their productivity and multiple um, commitments. So the Blackboard calendar has what's called an iCal um, integration. So you can get an external calendar link from the Blackboard calendar and then synchronize that into other calendar programs. So for example, in Outlook, you can have your calendar synchronize from Blackboard into your Outlook calendar and then combine your course due dates that you've specified in Blackboard automatically with your professional calendar. And in Outlook, it becomes a selectable calendar, so you can actually turn that layer on and off when you want to see it or not. There's a little bit of a configuration to make this work. You start by getting an external calendar link from Blackboard, which you do from the Blackboard calendar. And then you would open that as a a web-based or an external calendar in your other calendar program. So here's the link to our documentation on using the calendar in Blackboard that does specifically have a quick guide on syncing an iCal feed with Outlook. So if you're using Outlook for your personal calendar and you want to be able to pull your Blackboard calendar into it, uh, there is a link to instructions on how to do that on our Blackboard calendar page. 
uh, Keeney, it's it is similar to how a Google Calendar integration works, and I believe you can integrate it into a Google Calendar as long as Google Calendar can take an iCal feed, which I believe that it can. I'm not as familiar. But the iCal integration is really a very common one. I will also point out that the, it does take some time. So in some of our testing, we found that if you change something in Blackboard, it may take up to six or 12 hours to change in your personal calendar. It's not instantaneous. But it will synchronize and make those changes. Um, if you change it in Blackboard, it will eventually change in your personal calendar. There's just a bit of a delay. Fourth item, one that's kind of close to my heart because I am a color coding um, fiend, I guess, aficionado. I, I tend to color code lots of things. I blame my instructional design background. Uh, you can color code the grade center. So what this will do is change the color of the background or the color of the text for any cell in the grade center based on either its status, if it is um, in progress or needs grading, for example, or based on the grade range. So in this example, I've chosen to highlight any cell that needs grading in yellow. It kind of it matches that exclamation mark, but makes it more visible to me because the whole cell is yellow. And then I chose to highlight any student who was doing at um, 90%, any cell at 90% or higher in green. Those are the students who are doing really well. I wanted to be able to see those. And any student who is below a 75, I wanted to highlight them in orange so that I could follow up on those students if they needed more, um, more support. I will point out, I cut off the column headers, but this was the, um, the total and then an assignment one and assignment two. Um, that were graded. So the total column here is matching the assignment two since that's the only grade that's put in place. But it would let me see that a student's total grade perhaps was dropping as well as the fact that individual assignments had, had fallen below where we wanted them to be. Um, it doesn't change anything beyond that and it's only visible to you. It's not visible to students, but you can um, set up this to highlight and just make that more visible to you. So our, um, we have a tutorial on this that Blackboard created actually. So I put that link into the text chat. It's the same link at the bottom of the slide. But it will walk you through how to first set up your um, color codes and then how to turn them on and off in the Grade Center. So under in the Grade Center, under Manage, and then manage color codes or color coding, I think is what it says, is where you would set up the, the rules for how your color codes go on. And then in the far right, there's a button to toggle on showing the grade, the color codes or hiding the color codes. So you don't have to always see them if you find them distracting. Excellent, moving on, number five. This is a feature that many of you may already be avail aware of, so it may not count truthfully as a hidden gem, but I think it's one of the most useful tools in Blackboard for grading and assessment. So if you aren't using it, I wanted to take the opportunity to give uh, one more plea to try to uh, convince you to give it a try. And that is using the interactive rubrics in Blackboard to be able to give more detailed feedback to your students on what their, uh, why their grade was calculated a certain way. So with the interactive rubrics in Blackboard, you can grade students according to the rubrics that you've already set up, um, perhaps as Word documents. You can build those as Blackboard rubrics. And then you have no files to manage. I know a lot of faculty uh, grade with a rubric where they have a Word document, they'll fill it out per student, save that file, and then send the file to the student. The interactive rubrics takes out all of that added labor of saving multiple files and sending files over. It's a simple during uh, it's a simple part of the grading workflow, where you can open the rubric for any given student, 
And then essentially you click on a cell in order to select that level of achievement for the student. Blackboard will total the grade based on how you have built the rubric and also lets you give feedback for the student at each of the, for each of the rows. So you can give detailed feedback, as, as much detail as you would care to do. And then after the fact, you can run what's called the rubric evaluation report. You run this from the grade center, from the column header for any assignment that you've used a rubric on. And the rubric evaluation report will summarize the results and tell you what percentage of your students met each of the different levels on the rubric, as well as giving you um, averages for each criteria, standard deviations, um, mean, median, mode. So you get a little bit more analysis on how students performed on this rubric. Uh, they are a little time consuming to set up. I won't lie, um, because there is no import option. You can't take a Word document with a table and have Blackboard translate that into a rubric. But it is very um, forgiving for copy and paste. So if you have a rubric established in a Word document, you can copy the cells from your rubric, paste that into the Blackboard rubric. And the Blackboard rubric is also very flexible. So you can... Um, use this happens to be for our general education assessment this one is a no points rubric but you can specify them to use specific points for each level and differing points levels by the way for each criteria so the first criteria row could be worth 10 points at the accomplished level and the second one might be worth five points at the accomplished level or you can set this up as a percent rubric where each of the criteria rows has a weight and then each of the levels of achievement as columns carry a specific percentage of that weight. Um, if you have questions about the interactive Blackboard rubrics, we have a workshop coming up on October 25th. This one is face-to-face -face and hands-on. So if you're interested, please do uh, sign up for that. I'm going to give you first the link to our documentation on rubrics. That's how to work with rubrics in Blackboard. And then the second link is for actually registering for that workshop. So if you're interested in attending the workshop on rubrics, that second link will take you to the registration form um, so that you can sign up. It is, as I said, a face-to-face -face workshop on campus. So it's only open to NIU faculty and, and uh, graduate assistants. But uh, we do hope to see you there. Stephanie, did you want to? Um, Raise, it, did you have a comment you wanted to make with your microphone? So go ahead and click the microphone button to turn on your mic. So Keeney, um, if you go to Course Tools, Control Panel, Course Tools and Rubrics, that's where you can start setting up some rubrics. Otherwise, uh, they are on the assessment pages for anything that you are setting up with assessment. So for example, if you have an assignment, there's a select rubrics. So for example, if I'm building an assignment, I would select rubric and then the actual rubric. Um, you can also build a rubric using that workflow. When you're, and it, they work, by the way, not just on assignments. You can add rubrics to discussion boards, you can add a rubric to a grade center column, um, you add a, can add a rubric to a, a short answer or essay question on a test. Uh, there are lots of different places that you can use them. Uh, Stephanie, your question, how can you modify the rubric? So um, when you initially build the rubric, you can do that. Um, I like to do that before I'm connecting it to an assignment. So I tend to do, use the control panel course tools rubrics option. And then from there, you build out the table with each of the uh, levels of achievement across the, as columns, each of the criteria as rows, and then copy and paste the, if you have it already built in a Word document, the descriptions for each of those rows. You don't have to put a description into each cell, um, honestly, but pedagogically, it is actually fairly beneficial for students to see all of that extra detail. Um, once you have graded with a rubric, you can no longer modify it. Um, so if you have one that you have not yet graded with, 
Stephanie, I would go to Control Panel, Course Tools, Rubrics, and then there'll be that round drop down arrow you see everywhere. You can edit that rubric in order to change the cells. I also want to point out um, if you're looking for pedagogy of rubrics, we have a workshop coming up on that as well on October 18th. Janet Giesen's going to be leading that one, I believe. So, and of course, it turned the eight and a parentheses into a smiley face, but it's on October 18th, and the registration link for that's here too. Uh, so Stephanie, back to your question. If you've already used the rubric to grade once, then you can copy the rubric in order to make the changes. So instead of starting over from scratch, uh, duplicate the rubric or copy it, and then um, you can edit the copy of it and use that version going forward instead. Yeah, you don't want to build it from scratch if you can just copy what you had from to start with. Excellent, lots and lots of discussion on, on rubrics. So we have um, one more, and then I'm going to pause for uh, a break. But the last one I want to talk about is, again, related to assessments. And that is a brand new feature that was added in May when we did our annual Blackboard upgrade. So you can now, from the Grade Center, send a reminder to students who have any missing coursework in Blackboard. This is done per assessment based on the Grade Center columns that you have. Uh, and you click the drop down arrow in the Grade Center for that column in the column header. So this is a, a, a Blackboard review uh, assignment that students needed to do. You can see that there are three students who have already submitted it, but I have several who have not yet submitted it. So if I click that drop down arrow, I can choose Send Reminder. And Blackboard will um, automatically send a reminder to any student who does not have a submission or a grade for that particular assessment. The system generated email will list the course name, the coursework name, which is whatever this um, column title would be and the due date, if a due date was specified. If it's system generated, you can't modify the language. It um, essentially says, you have missing coursework in this course. This assignment, um, you have not yet submitted this assignment, which is due by this date. Uh, it's very similar. I don't remember the exact language, but um, very, very generic, but it will include those variables from your course. And this reminder, will work with any, um, any assignment where students have submitted something or should be a sitting, submitting something. So an assignment, a um, discussion, a test. And it should also work with a manual column based on whether or not you have entered a grade for a student. So this is, um, it does require a little bit of work since it's not fully automated. You would come in and choose to send the reminder but you don't have to uh, look up students and contact them directly in order to send them the reminder, that prompt, in order to submit their work. As I said, brand new, something that you probably have not found yet. So for those of you who have been using Blackboard for quite some time, at least there are hopefully a couple things here that you haven't seen before. So let me jump back here for a second. and. Since you have access to the drawing tools up at the top, above the, the slide here, take a moment to select, say, the pencil icon and put a check mark or a dash or something next to the, the hidden gem that you've found most useful so far. What's your favorite one so far? If you click the pencil, then you can draw anywhere on the slide. Looks like we've got a couple marks on exporting the Blackboard calendar. Quite a few whoo, on color coding. I'm glad I've got other fans of color coding here. Um, date management's always really popular. Reminders, whoo, everybody just likes everything. Well, that's cool. <laughs> uh, sending the reminders, as I said, is brand new. It's very fun. Rubrics and color coding. And exporting and due dates. Lots of people like those. I started off with the, the easy one with the mobile. So I'm not, not upset that no one chose that one. 
that's good too. Awesome. Thanks everyone for <laughs> putting your um, your spin and your contribution there onto our um, discussion. All right, moving on. So our our next hidden gem is being able now to verify students' submissions to assignments. Um, right now, this is only available on assignments, but hopefully we'll see it on a few other things. When students submit an assignment now, they've attached their file or typed out their message, they click Submit. Students now receive a confirmation number as part of that submission. So you can see that here. Uh, it's a fairly long uh, string of random digits, uh, alphanumeric characters that the student can copy in, out of the browser or take a screenshot of in order to save that as their verification that they submitted. Um, then, once they have that confirmation number, you can verify a student submission by going to the Grade Center. So on the full Grade Center, if you open the Reports menu, you can look at Student Receipts. And that Student Receipt list will show you each student, their confirmation number, what the assignment was, and the date and time that they submitted. So this is a, another confirmation if the students emails to say that they, they thought they submitted, but they're not sure what happened. You can, they could give you their confirmation number, or you could come here to look up um, that, that student and see what their submission was. In the future, these um, confirmation codes will actually be sent to students via email. This is sort of a, a first iteration where they come in, uh, the students get a confirmation number in the browser, and you can view the receipts from the Grade Center. And yes, Keeney, it's from the Reports dropdown in the Grade Center. Uh, so Reports, and then Student Receipts. Uh, it's one more way to verify if, if students claim that they haven't submitted something uh, on how to see it. Marsha, so when you first come in, it will tell you that you have to look for a student. If you can see here in the background, let me clear all my drawing. I chose the, the setting for username not blank. That setting is going to give you the full list of students so that you can see anyone who submitted anywhere in your course. Does that help? The username not blank, or even last name not blank, any of those options will, will work. Great. Um, all right, next one. That's a pretty quick one. The next one has a little bit more meat on it. We'll look at a couple of different um, test features. Uh, let me answer Nick's first question first. How is it different than seeing the needs grading? Uh, so the submission receipt is a bit more um, permanent. For one, it's primarily meant so that the students can generate that confirmation number for their own confirmation. So if I'm a student and I say, wait, 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 I submitted it, here's my confirmation number. If something happens to the submission, if it's cleared, uh, that submission number is still going to be retained. Uh, or if a student says, wait, 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 I submitted, you can ask them, well, do you have a confirmation number? Um, particularly once they, they're sent via email, then the students can provide you with that confirmation number, essentially as evidence that they had submitted uh, and nothing came in. It's, like I said, it's just one more level of verification. And you can also let students know if they don't get a confirmation number, if they don't see that, their submission wasn't successful. Hopefully cutting down on the number of questions about, wait, 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 I submitted it, what happened? Because they can always go in and submit it, or go in and, and verify it. So looking at some test features. The Blackboard tests have a lot of options, um, and I'm not going to go into tests overall. But if you are using tests in Blackboard, a couple of um, things that you may want to pay attention to. One is you can validate the student's test log. So, or review, I should say, your, the student's test log. Uh, 
If they've um, taken the test, once that's complete, you can view this access log to see when the student started the test and how they answered questions, when they saved an answer, when they went back and changed an answer again. Um, you could see how much time was spent between questions. Uh, it's worth noting this time spent is not necessarily time actively spent on that question. It's essentially the, the difference between the time um, from one answer saved to the next. So it says that I spent, well, that this student spent 10 seconds on question one. Um, so that, that would seem like they read question one, thought about it, and marked an answer within 10 seconds. It really means that they clicked that answer 10 seconds after the prior activity. So if you see a long stretch of time, if there's, you know, five or 10 minutes or, or 30 minutes, it might be that they were actively trying to work on that problem. It might be that they went and took a break and came back. Um, either one is a possibility. The access log will also tell you if there are any, um, any issues with the student's work. So for example, if the student is kicked out of the test, that there would be a disconnect in their access log. Um, or if, they're, um, if they left the test and come back into the test, that will show up here as well. And then it will tell, at the very bottom, will tell you when the test was submitted so that you could see um, if they submitted it, if it was an auto submit because the timer ran out and you had auto submit enabled. Um, all of those sorts of things can be seen here within the test access log. This is available on a single student's attempt. So if you view a student attempt for a test from the Grade Center, then you need to open this test information area. By default, this is closed and you won't see any of this information until you open the test information. But notice that it's not just the access log. I think that's the coolest one that it tells you, but it will also tell you when they started it, when they submitted it. Uh, notice this was late, so I get a little flag here that this was a late submission. Um, in this case, the score is zero because it was um, auto-submitted and needs to be reviewed before the, the grade will be uh, validated. That's why it's in needs grading status. But yes, um, Kanjana, lots and lots of info. If you, you wouldn't necessarily want to dig into this for every single student, but if there is an issue or you're curious about a, a student's progress, you can go in and see all of those. And Keeney, I'll get to your question. I'll go back to that when I finish this section. Promise. The other um, that's going to make our test data nerds happy. The other hidden feature on tests is item analysis. Item analysis gives you uh, a little bit more detailed view and some statistics about each test question on your test. So it will tell you at first, just to begin with, what the points possible and the average scores were like. Um, it will tell you what the average time spent on the test is as well. This was just a, a testing quiz, so there's barely any time spent in any of these attempts. But then Blackboard will also calculate discrimination and difficulty metrics based on student submissions. So without going too far into it, because I'm not uh, as well versed in these as many other people are, discrimination will tell you how well this test question did at essentially discriminating between the high achieving or lower achieving performing students. Um, uh, it's a one to negative one metric, so the closer it is to one, the better the discrimination. And if it is, in fact, uh, negative, that means that the high-performing students overall on this test actually got this question wrong more often than the students who did not do well on the test overall. Discrimination can help you determine if this is a good question or if it was perhaps a misleading question, or if there was maybe a problem with a a miscoded answer where the high performing students got this question wrong because the wrong answer is actually marked right. The difficulty is actually just the proportion, the way that Blackboard's calculating it, is just the percentage of students who got it right. Um, so the higher the difficulty percentage, the easier the question was. It's kind of an odd metric to use, but it will give you a sense of, um, 
whether or not more students got this right or fewer students got it right. Uh, and then you get average, standard deviation, and error um, as a, a measure as well on this. You'll notice that, for example, here I have a cannot calculate for discrimination on the third question. That's because all of the students got it right, so there was no discrimination um, on this question, no discrimination index on that question. You can review the item analysis from lots of different places in Blackboard. So you can get to the item analysis from the tests page, from the deployed test, or the Grade Center column header. Again, for example, if you're at the Grade Center column for the test, you would click the round drop-down arrow and choose item analysis in order to view this uh, report. I want to catch up really quickly with um, some links that I didn't share. So here is the uh, item analysis link where you can find out more about running an item analysis and interpreting one. So Kini, to back to your question about, or Kenny, I'm so sorry, um, validating a real submission on the assignments. What it will do is it validates that the student clicked submit. So it's not going to validate that the assignment confirmation number uh, checks for a file being submitted or the correct file being submitted. What it does verify is the student did legitimately click the submit button. So now to your, your second question. You've had students submit, yes, the blank page and say that they had submitted the assignment. Um, that, that is the distinction that it does not actually validate the file. What I tell students in that case is because the, um, the in-grade, in-line assignment tool now displays their file, that they need to ensure that they, they can see that file, or they need to click the link and download the file to make sure that I actually, that Blackboard actually submitted that file correctly. And if I don't have the file, then, um, and they haven't validated that it was correct and sent me a comment right away that it was a problem, that um, it sounds, more like they're just trying to make an excuse and blame the system for their late submission. Um, so it's, it's not going to ensure that the file can be opened. All it's going to do is um, validate that they clicked submit. But great question. And like I said, I, again, it's their responsibility to make sure that it was submitted and that it seems like it could be opened. And so I ask them to do that as soon as they've submitted. Um, and if not, get back to me right away so that I, I, there isn't a delay when two days later I tell them I can't open their file. They should be contacting me because of it. Uh, John, these colored dots, those are questions that Blackboard thinks may have a problem, quote unquote. Uh, it means that they think that you should pay attention to it. It might be a discrimination index that's backwards. So if the discrimination index is negative, Blackboard will flag that, um, that perhaps there's a problem with how this question was marked correct. Or if, it's, if all of the students get it correct, then Blackboard will flag those. Um, not that we don't want students to get correct answers, but essentially that this question might be um, too easy or um, isn't contributing overall to the assessment of or the the differentiation of student performance so it's it's just meant to kind of draw your attention that's all that it really means and if it's that all the students got it right and that's why it's being flagged that might in fact be perfectly fine and be a good thing because it meant that students had mastered that concept yep great question All right, next up, profiles. I really do like Blackboard's profile system. It's not as extensive as most social media platforms, but it can help you build some community into your course. So you and your students can build a Blackboard profile through the global navigation menu. That's the fancy term for the menu that has your name on it up at the top of Blackboard, right next to Logout. So if you click and open that menu, you can click on the very first icon, which is a silhouette of a person, that will take you to where you can build your profile. In your profile, you can add a photo, you can add a, a short bio. So you can see I have a photo for Willa Cather and a short biography for her. You can also build out this tile system 
with uh, anything you want to share about yourself. There are tiles for working at the university as well as tiles for being a student. So this one shows that I'm a student majoring in English language and literature, pursuing a doctorate degree. This GPA, by the way, is an optional uh, choice to add. Most students may not want to do that, and that's perfectly fine. We just wanted to show that it is there. Um, if you choose instead to create a profile that you teach for the university, then it will ask, um, then you can put in more information around uh, what your field is or what you teach. And there's a, a wide variety of these tiles in the tile library that's just farther down. Once you've built this profile, it's visible several places throughout Blackboard. So this first view at the back here, if I scribble back here in the upper left, is the discussion thread list. So if you're looking at the discussion threads, when you can see the author's names, notice there's a tiny thumbnail photo from the, the profile. Within a discussion itself, so here I have an initial post and a reply. The profile photos, again, show up here in the discussion. And then if you hover over one of these profile photos, then you get the um, kind of hovering card, floating card view that will show some of those tiles that were set up on the profile as well. So the profile photos show up um, pretty regularly on interactive tools throughout Blackboard, like the discussion board or journals and blogs. They also appear on the roster or the user list. And while um, by no means meant to become a social network or, or a social media platform, if students build their profiles, it does create more of a sense of community as students interact with one another. I request that my students fill out their profile. I, I don't require it. I don't grade them on whether or not they've done it. But I strongly encourage and I really request that they do. I do give them the flexibility to add any photo, not necessarily a photo of themselves, but of something that represents themselves and something that would be academically and professionally appropriate, reminding them that they're building reputation and building a network that will be useful to them when they graduate. I don't want students to um, post something that they think is uh, funny or um, uh, extreme, potentially lewd. I want them to post something that contributes to the, the community of the course. And I haven't seen any issues with it. If there were an issue, then I could follow up with them or follow through disciplinary channels um, if it were that offensive or discriminatory. Um, but it is a way to just build in that, um, like I said, that, that sense of connection and knowing of recognizing who people are. So the profiles, we have information on for students on how to build their profile. I put that link into the, the text chat for you there. Another hidden gem, something that um, has been around for a little while, but we haven't highlighted very widely, is achievements. So achievements, you would get to under control panel, course tools, and then achievements. What the Achievements tool does is it allows you to award either a badge or a certificate based on um, some sort of achievement within your course. So for example, you might award a badge, which is basically a digital sticker, but it's a nice feel-good recognition um, for achieving certain milestones in the course, for mastering um, a topic, maybe it's after they pass a unit, they can get a badge for having mastered that unit. Or for otherwise being exceptional, maybe there's a badge for uh, being a top discussion contributor or for um, finding a mistake in the course and, and offering that as uh, um, feedback so that you can correct it. That they can get just that little bit of recognition that says that uh, they, they achieved something, they contributed something that was positive. I have a course where I have um, several, a, a semester long project, but distinct milestones. And I award the badge if students have gotten 80% or higher on each phase of the project. If they have a lower score, they can revise and resubmit to try to get the badge, or they can keep the grade 
and have that contribute to their final score. And I found it's actually fairly motivating for students to want that, um, that achievement to get that badge. And then certificates you can use for um, more significant accomplishments. It's actually a, a file that students could save as a PDF to keep a certificate on file themselves or print and put on their wall. Um, you might do a certificate for completing the course or passing a, um, sp uh, a bigger assignment um, or, again, a certificate for re uh, a reward of some sort. Uh, you've also probably seen here at NIU um, certificates awarded for the uh, Title IX training that's held through Blackboard. You get a certificate um, when you've completed it, and that's how they're doing that. Uh, Kenny, the, um, the badges are portable to the Mozilla Badge backpack. Uh, there's a little bit of a technical barrier in that they need to use the same um, email address for their badge backpack as would be used in Blackboard. So they'd have to use their student email address for the backpack to export it. Um, on LinkedIn, there's no um, integration between these two. Uh, they could of course, take a, a screenshot to save the image um, and put that elsewhere. But no, otherwise, the only integration for the badges is with the badge backpack. Moving along, um, our next to last topic is the retention center. So the retention center is available in the control panel evaluation retention center. And this will let you know what students might be at risk or struggling in your course. Uh, it's a, a very light analytics platform. Essentially, it tracks students who have missed deadlines, who have um, grades that are more than 25% below the course average, or that um, who haven't been logging in regularly or whose activity is below the class average. Uh, activity measured by how many times they've clicked on things, how much time they've spent in the course. So the retention center will um, monitor to see which students have met, have um, triggered one of those warnings. And then when you review those warnings, you can um, use the notify option to write an email to those students the benefit of emailing students through the retention center is those conversations that well, your messages sent to the students are actually then retained in Blackboard. So instead of sending email um, through Blackboard or through Outlook and keeping a record in your own um, email box, these messages are also saved in Blackboard. You can customize the retention center. So you could change the, the tools, the, their thresholds for what they're monitoring. Um, you can also flag students with the, the star so that you monitor that student a little bit more closely. Maybe they, they were at risk and they're on the, the upward swing and you want to be able to keep track of that. Uh, down at the bottom of the retention center, there's actually a, an area that also tracks your activity. Nobody sees it but you, but it lets you realize that, oh, I have 30 submissions that have um, been waiting for grading for two weeks that might affect my students' performance um, so that you can see and be a little more aware of your own activity. So Kenny, uh, what do we do if we notice, notify them and they don't reply and they still have bad grades? You would still follow whatever the retention strategies are for your department, whether that means referring them to an academic resource unit like um, a, a tutoring center or their advisor um, or perhaps the, the department chair or a program coordinator. It really differs by department. Um, for any uh, teaching assistants who are listening, that would be a good indication that you should talk to your supervising faculty as well for their advice on how you should proceed. But this does give you um, a better way to identify which students might need more, um, more attention. Since I didn't put the links in, I just want to quickly, I forgot to add achievements. So there's the achievements link. And then here is a link to the retention center for more information on that. And then the final area that I want to touch on very briefly is tracking student learning outcomes in Blackboard. We have uh, in all of our courses a variety of assessments that are measuring student learning. And what we would really like to see both, uh, I think, individually in many cases, departmentally, programmatically, 
institutionally and from our accreditors is how are students doing on our learning outcomes overall, whether those are our program outcomes, our accreditation standards, or some other metric that we're measuring for students. The goals and alignments feature lets you build custom goals in Blackboard and then align those to assessments. So here I have three standards that are all being addressed by this one paper, although I can align to just about any assessment tool in Blackboard, including tests and individual test questions, uh, rubrics, or um, simply grade center columns if I don't have another assessment in Blackboard. Then that data can be used to look at individual student achievement. So this is the goal performance report within a single course, a single student's performance. I can see how she or he is doing on each of the standards. I can look at it overall for my course on how my students overall are doing on the standards. And I can look at how all of my students are doing across all of their courses in a single aggregate report. I'm not going to go into detail because we do have a workshop coming up on October 16th that will do a lot more detail on how this works, but it's one of those hidden gems that can really transform the way your department and your faculty handle the assessment of your, of your outcomes. So we have information on the alignments here, and I have a link for that um, uh, registration for that workshop. It is held online, so it's open to anyone and will be on October 16th at noon if you're interested in more details on that. You can also contact me if directly if you'd like a more one-on-one -on -one review of these alignments and outcomes. So here's the whole list. It's a lot, I know. Um, I will send out the recording from this presentation and links to all of the documentation that I've been sharing on all of these different hidden gems. Um, I do want to make sure you know that we are always here to help you. So if you have questions on these or any other features in Blackboard, please feel free to reach out either to me or to the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center. Uh, if you have any other questions, I know we are at 1 o'clock, so I don't want to hold anyone. I want to thank you all for joining me. And if you have questions, I'm happy to stay after to answer them for you. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. today.